That was oh. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, I see a couple old friends. Oh, wow. I, ha I have a new colleague and former colleague here, which is great, but a lot of friends in the room as well, and it's wonderful to be at the Reagan Center. It's such an amazing venue for a really important event like this, and I think that this panel in particular is um, very interesting to not only those of us in the room, but our, our country, our citizens, and our allies, and possibly even our enemies. Um, just a moment here for me to introduce you. Da uh, General David Berger, he's the Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, and the Honorable Gilbert Cisneros. He is the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. You all probably know Senator Tammy Duckworth and Congressman Mike Gallagher. So welcome to all of you. One of the great things that the Reagan Defense Forum does is provide us data and research, and you can't fix or adjust what you don't measure, and so now we have some of these measurements. And on this, in, on this one in particular, I think it's important to point out a couple of slides from that will help describe and set up the conversation. If we could pull up the slide here about reasons for decreased confidence in the military, okay? Um, the slide, you know, it takes a long time to build up trust, and it can be lost pretty quickly. In the last four years, trust in the military has gone from, from in the 70, like on 70 percent to now in the high 40s. That's, that's a precipitous drop. I think that's very concerning, and we're going to talk about why and what we do about it to try to make it better. But one of the things here that you'll see is that if you just look at the great deal or sum of concern about why the, res the respondents believe that they have a decreased confidence in the military. First of all, uh, so-called woke practices, undermining military effectiveness. You have also concern about far right-wing extremists serving in the military. That was a little bit less, to a lesser extent, than the wokeism. Uh, military leadership being overly politicized. You have also, I thought this one was an important one to keep in mind, is the performance and competence of presidents as a commander-in-chief. So all of those things are apparently leading to people having a decreased confidence in the military. And then this, this next slide is something that is also something very important and something that uh, the Commandant and uh, the Honorable Cis uh, Gil Cisneros will talk about, and that is who's willing to join. And I thought this was very interesting, right? They extremely willing to join is at 6%, very willing 7%, and then it, you know, right there in the middle, but not willing at all at 26%. And maybe, I, and I'll ask you to start, uh, General, is that, in your perspective, the scope and scale of the problem, how do you describe it? You wrote a really great piece, I, can't, I didn't bring it with me, um, but it was a, a longer piece describing what the problem is, your concern about it, and you advocated for some bold changes, but maybe let's just start with how do you see the scope and scale of the problem? For propensity, I would say. Uh, Context matters. Um, I was on recruiting duty in the mid-80s, and I came in the, the Marine Corps in the late 70s, so probably like a lot of people in the room, you see, uh, you see a change over time. A snapshot one year, uh, helpful to understand if you put it in context. I think propensity has always been a challenge, regardless of the economy, regardless of what's going on in the world, but there is clearly a cycle of when the nation is involved in a conflict and everybody's focused, attention on their awareness is up. Mm -hmm. That's um, a high point. And then in between conflicts, it drops off, either because they're not aware of the military, don't know anyone in the military, uh, or because things they see they don't like. So I think it's absolutely something we should pay attention to. It's not something we should hit the panic button on, but we should absolutely pay attention. This is what the recruiting force does. Okay, and I will encourage them. They can talk amongst themselves yeah. as well. I don't have to be the, no. um, the go-to every single time, but we will kick it off this way and then mix up a little bit. Mr. Secretary, what do you think? Uh, you know, I think the Commandant was right on when he said there, there's a, a civilian military divide. Uh, less and less people uh, know somebody who served in the military. Uh, you know, my dad served, my uncle served, my grandfather served. Uh, to me, it was something that they all did, and, and, but that's becoming less and less. Um, you know, I think the thing that we need to get out there is to really get out there and share our story and really where we can work with Congress is to put out this message of, of service and the benefits of service. And, and that's one of the things, you know, hopefully going into next year, we'll be able to start working with 
the Congress on the Hask and the, the Sask about really getting after how do we get this message out of service to the country and whether it be you know and, and some other thing that they can do publicly or, or really serving in the military but we have to be able to get out there and tell our story and the benefits of service and, and how it's really changed lives it changed mine and i know it can do the same thing for others senator um, I think we have shrunk our pool of people that we go to to recruit from over time, and I think that we need to re-expand that pool. Um, yes, there is this, there is a, a growing trend in our society where you have the military families and the non-military families. So those military families keep serving over and over again, that's where we go to. But there are folks that in the past, like say DACA um, uh, recipients, uh, uh, you used to be able to gain citizenship from serving in the military, and we stopped that. Uh, I, I think there are people who are eager and do want to serve, but don't have the opportunity to serve. I've talked to recruiters, and they'll say, you know, I, I say, well, how how many have you turned down? You know, of people who want to serve, could serve, could pass the ASVAP test, could do all of that, but but they're DACA, um, and they turn away a lot of folks. So I think that. We've shrunk our recruiting pool so much that uh, um, we, we keep going back to the same well, and we need to look at expanding that, expanding that pool. But there is this trend within our society. It's not just with the military. It's also we're seeing this also with people who uh, go into professions other than ones that require a college degree. Right? For so long, every child graduating high school, the mark of success out of high school is did you get accepted into a college? Uh, right now. We need more people who can work as machinists. We need more people in manufacturing, all of that. And we're actually trying to grow that workforce in manufacturing in the same way. So that trend is, is across society. It's not just with military. It's, that's a really interesting point. And just last week, I, I can't remember if it was the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal had a big feature story on the front page about how major companies in America like IBM are rethinking their requirements for because they are looking for the talent pool as well to want to join. Yeah. So it's a really interesting point. Yeah. Congressman? Well, there's no, uh, there's no baseline to compare the propensity numbers against. So you kind of got to go to the so-called Jammers uh, survey. That's the youth survey DOD does. And if you look at that, what we're seeing is that we're at the lowest level for propensity since 2007. And if you dig into the cross tabs to see why people don't have as much of a propensity to serve, they cite fear of physical injury and fear of psychological and emotional harm which really makes no sense relative to 2007, right? In other words, in 2007, that can make some sense. I mean, things are pretty bad in Iraq at that point. Um, you, if you join the Marine Corps at that time, you're pretty well guaranteed to go fight uh, in Iraq. Uh, that's not the case today. So there's something bigger going on that's upstream of military policy. I will say, however, uh, I completely agree with what the senator said about um, uh, college and uh, really the cultural issue we confront. I'll hear people in my district all the time say, not every kid needs to go to college, right? We got great jobs. You can make 75 grand a year welding here, there. And I'll say, well, what about your kids? And they'll say, well, my kids are going to college, right? Because it's still that stigma associated with. So that's part of it. Uh, I would submit that if 33% if of 16 to 28 year olds are not going to get the vaccine, that the vaccine mandate has to play uh, a role there. Uh, we're going to be considering that policy this week and certainly in the next uh, Congress. Um, I think it's great. The Commandant's article was fantastic. It was the boldest thing I've seen written on the subject. I might disagree a little bit about the role of retention in terms of a, a solution because retention, if you lean on that too heavily, you got an older force and war is a young man and women's game. Um, but I do think we, the fact we have senior leaders, I saw Secretary Kendall uh, in the green room, we had uh, SecNav, Secretary Kendall, Secretary of the Army out there with a the joint op-ed. That's great. We need senior leaders in the Pentagon, including the SecDef and the DepSecDef, going to middle America talking about this issue, talking about the value of service, talking about the challenge associated with service. And in some ways, and I'll shut up after this, I think the message actually, it'd be more effective if it's less about an inclusive environment, right? Because the military, in some level, is an exclusive challenge. We have an all-volunteer force. We want the best and the brightest in our military. And I think that certainly what was appealing to me when I considered joining the Marine Corps. And the, probably the best example of that in terms of Marine Corps recruiting was the infamous Lava Monster recruiting commercial in 1998, right? It was this <laughs> crazy thing that seems almost comical in retrospect. But it inspired a lot of people around the idea that, okay, this is a massive challenge and I want 
that challenge. So I think there are ways we can fix it, but right now, the all-volunteer force is in jeopardy because of the recruiting numbers we're seeing. I, I do want to touch on retention a little bit, though. Sure. I think that we don't do a good job of asking people who leave after their first enlistment why they're leaving. Um, and because we need to try to retain those guys, right? Those are the folks who oftentimes they haven't made E5, right? They're, they're leaving after that first term. And I, I would like to know why they're leaving because retaining those folks are important. Sure. The young, the, the folks are going to become the young NCOs. And um, I, I, I would love to dig into those numbers more. I was also reading about um, on, in terms of retention, especially if you have two, a couple, a married couple serving mm -hmm. in the military. Uh, if one gets promoted, uh, well, maybe they'll have to leave, but does one have to retire? How do they move together? And some of the changes there that I thought were interesting, especially for um, spouses who are working maybe outside of the military, can we help them as well? I know there's some push on that. I do, I do want to ask, General, when you hear, when you see something in the survey results that says that people um, are concerned about wokeism in the military, how does that read to you? Like, what do you think they are saying? How, that could be, it could have lots of different definitions, but what does it mean to you? Probably the best way to answer it, I would say, when you go to visit units, and uh, the secretary was telling me last week he was at Camp Pendleton during Thanksgiving, like many people do, uh, helping out, feeding in the chow hall. The, the way to answer the, the question, you know, how do you feel about it, is how do, the, how do the Marines feel about it? How do the soldiers, sailors, airmen, feel, how do they feel about it? I don't see it. I don't hear it. I don't, they're not talking about it. It's not a factor for them at all. It's important, I think, in a survey, you know, to pay attention to, but I, I don't know about you all, but I don't see uh, a conversation or an impact of wokeism in the rank and file at all. You've written about it a lot, Congressman. What do you think? Uh, I, I disagree somewhat. Oh, first of all, let's just have the like a little bit of humility with these numbers, right? The survey is very valuable, but 14% of respondents say North Korea is an ally. 7% say <laughs> Australia is an enemy. I mean, the survey shows a, a great deal of trust in Congress going up. I mean, granted, from 5 to 9%, but. Hey, we're headed in the right direction. Uh, and the media is yeah, right behind you. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they used to trust cockroaches more yeah, they, than Congress right, a few years right. back. So Those McCain's things as, as staffers and blood relatives. Yeah, uh, we're. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, unpack the top three issues cited in terms of great deal. Politicization of military leadership, uh, presidential performance, and wokeness. So the first two are evenly distributed among Democrats and Republicans, roughly. So you can't just say it's, you know, uh, Republican Fox News watchers skewing the data, right? And that makes sense, because we've had both parties in recent years have recently retired generals speak at political conventions, calling the other party's nominee a national security threat. Both parties have changed the law in recent years to allow recently retired generals to serve as Secretary of Defense after not having done so for 67 years. We've had conspicuous incidents like the Lafayette Square debacle. And then on presidential performance, Afghanistan has to be playing part of, of, of that story, right? I mean, uh, the, the way in which the so-called logistical success of our surrender to terrorists in Afghanistan played out. I, I can, I, what I'm saying is I can construct a, a narrative uh, for both of those top two variables. The third one, wokeness, right? So that it does skew Republican. But if you add up some degree and great degree, that's 50% of respondents saying woke policies are an issue. So you can debate the value of DEI programs. You can debate whether they contribute to lethality. But I don't think it's debatable that it is a problem. It is happening. There are hundreds of examples of this happening in the military, and I am hearing it. I'm hearing it from constituents that are on active duty or have families in the military. So again, reasonable people can debate the value of the growing DEI bureaucracy, but there's no question as to whether it is growing in the military and that Americans are concerned about it, albeit a greater number of Republicans and Democrats. The, uh, the survey this year, ask more detailed questions from what I recall years before, which I thought, like you pointed out, really helpful. Mm -hmm. So on propensity, in the pages when you flip it back and they break it down by gender, by age, then you, especially in the age category, um, I, I may be off by a percentage or two, but the population like 30 years and below is 11% higher than last year. Well, that's a good thing, right? That means 11% of the recruitable population sees, is more propensity than they were the year before. Some of that could be kids back in high school seeing recruiters that they didn't see when they were 
at home. It could be a lot of things, but I th there are trends that are moving, I think, in the right direction. The, the, the breakdown in, in a greater degree of specificity really helpful, I think. Mr. Secretary, what about your perspective? You know, I, again, I, I was just at uh, Naval Station San Diego, and I went down to Miramar to visit the, the Marines and the sailors down there in the San Diego area, and I, I've talked to soldiers and, and, and airmen and guardians all over, and, you know, they're always coming to me about, like, their things, they're, they're worried about their families, right? How can we take care of the families? How can we do that? And, uh, you know, they want to know how we can improve the EFMP programs, you know, how can we take care of our, our health care? Uh, these are the issues that they're talking to me. And, you know, and around DEIA, it's, to me, that's providing opportunity. Um, how do we provide opportunities to individuals for them to go out and to succeed? And, and it's individuals no matter where they might come from, right? We want to have diversity of geography, diversity of thought. You know, women are becoming a bigger part of our force, and we need to make sure that they are given the opportunity to su succeed. And, and really, that is what we are doing with diversity is out there. It's about creating opportunity. It's not about creating some type of um, culture there that it's going to ensure that we're keeping people down, but really about creating opportunity. And these are the things that people want. They want the opportunity to succeed. They want to know that they we're going to take care of their families, and that's continually what I'm hearing. But any of you want to comment on, on the other sides of that coin that in the, in the survey, so-called far-right or extremist individuals serving in the military, um, if you take a great deal in some, that's at 46%, saying that they think that's one of the reasons there's a decrease in the military. I'll open it up to anybody. Go ahead, Mike. It is sort of, so it skews Democrat in the way that the wokeism numbers skew Republican, right. right? So the question then is, is it true, right? Is it true that the military has a problem with far-right extremists, right? What do the numbers actually say? Well, the Senate, in a bipartisan fashion, actually concluded after looking into this uh, issue that for the military to keep burning resources on examining exceedingly rare cases of extremism was a waste of taxpayer dollars and should be discontinued immediately. The Secretary's Counter Extremism Working Group, which relies on something called the Pyrus data set, uh, the numbers are basically that there are 0.007% in terms of cases of far-right extremism. If you average it over time, it's actually 0.000. 1%, and then you go a layer deeper, you see bad social science lurking in the background here, like in most things. The data set omits 17,000 cases in the summer of 2020. If only a fraction of those were included, it would show a declining uh, uh, relative amount of extremism relative to the general population. The implication being, we should look to the military for advice on how we control rising extremism in an overall more radicalized society, right? And finally, to connect it to the overall topic of this panel, which is declining trust in the military and propensity and all of these things. Think about the effect that has. If you, if you were thinking about joining the military and you opened up a newspaper, if you opened up the New York Times in the beginning of February 2021, you would have seen a headline that said, Secretary Austin ramps up uh, fight against far-right extremists in the military. So if you open that and you saw the headline, you would conclude, my gosh, the military is filled with a bunch of far-right extremists. Except empirically, that's not true. Now, our goal could, should be zero, for sure. And there are ways in which the culture war comes from the right, just as bad as it comes from the left. But that headline and that narrative, I think, is very damaging, particularly when we're in the midst of the biggest recruiting crisis since the creation of the all-volunteer force. And, you know, I, I would have to say that perception is, that's the problem that we have right now. We need to be talking about what is keeping parents from encouraging their children to serve, and what is keeping the population of young people 18 to 24 from looking to the military as an avenue for them to pursue, uh, you know, the next steps in life after high school. Um, and I do think that uh, just as my colleague talked about this, you know, he talked about the headline with Secretary Austin. The flip side of that is seeing General Milley walking behind President Trump, who just cleared Lafayette Square of, of peaceful protesters and then holding up, you know, and standing in front of, of uh, a church with a Bible that he borrowed from someone. So we need to stop that on both sides, right? We need to stop that. We need to make sure the military remains apolitical, make that clear. But then we got to go back. 
we gotta go back to what is it that parents are seeing? What messages are parents receiving? What messages are young people receiving? Why are they not, when they're looking at, when they're doing their search pattern of what do I do after high school, why is the military not one of those things? And, and there's a number of reasons. One of the things that used to be, that the military used to offer was, this was a great place for you to go spend some time and get good training that was gonna be useful to you in your career field post-military. And I don't hear that as much, unless you become a help, unless, be, unless you become a pilot. Then you know, that's, that's sort of a pathway to the airlines, right? But if you're not becoming a pilot, you don't hear people saying the way my father's generation did that, hey, enlisting is a great stepping stone towards a career afterwards, and you're gonna get great skills in the military. So there's all sorts of factors that go into why people are not looking at the military as one of the viable avenues post high school graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's talking to the parents, it's making sure that we keep the military apolitical, but it's also really not selling, but, but showing to the American public what a stint in the military does for, you, for a young person. It allows them to mature, grow, they gain lots of great experiences. They're gonna be ahead of their peers when they come out in terms of a job, you know, a career field, all of that, that I don't think we're doing a good job of messaging to the this American is, people. Uh, I, I agree, this is key. We talk about service and what it does for the country, but yeah. service, what it does for the individual, the way yeah. you all are talking about is what we have to talk about more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, in some cases, it's a skill that will translate into later in life. But for, I would say, for my background, for most, it's intangible values, it's, it's uh, self-discipline, it's the, it's the parts that will make them successful later on, no matter what they do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that they're gonna pick up when they serve, and when they get out, whether it's four years or later, that, that's gonna translate, and everybody wants to hire those people. They're better citizens, they're better employees. And the second part, I would say, is uh, although most people in America would probably understand it as an all-volunteer force, it's an all-recruited force. In other words, the, the role of the recruiter and the translation to coaches and teachers and people in the community is huge. And we lost two years of that uh, due to the pandemic. That will cycle back where all those people in the communities and the schools will be very familiar with military people again. And the influencers that affect the high school kids, you know, thinking are back in play again. I think it will settle itself out. Yeah, you know, I, I met a, a young airman and I asked him, what is your MOS? What are you doing in, in the Air Force? He says, I, I'm doing HVAC. And I thought, wow, this is, we're giving you a career. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a skill that you're gonna have, whether you stay in four years or you stay in 20 years, you know, doing this, uh, you're gonna have a job and, and a career that you're gonna be able to go and, and take advantage of for the rest of your life. Uh, and, and it's a good career. Um, and these are the stories that I say we need to get out and tell more, right? And, and we need to counter these, mm -hmm. these narratives. The, the, the extreme vast majority of people in our military are doing it right. You know, every once in a while there's a bad apple. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to make sure that we're, we're taking care of those, those situations, right? And we're doing the training to let people know what needs to be done right and, and what's the proper way to act. And that's what we're doing. But you know, we understand and we know the vast majority of people are doing it right. And we need to tell those stories and we need to get back to telling the benefit of service and how it can affect that individual. Yeah. On America's Newsroom, Bill and I recently reported on a survey of young people and what, and what they said that they wanted to do when they grow up. Like, what do they want to be? And I would imagine that they don't think that mm. military service is going to help them become a TikTok influencer. Mm -hmm which is what a lot of them said that they wanted to, really wanted to be. Um, we should have a TikTok panel too at some point maybe. Um, I, I am curious, General, if you could talk about the concerns of, is there a concern about our readiness because of these things that we're talking about now? Uh, in, an, in one word, no. Readiness of the forces as uh, we have them that need to deploy, need to be prepared for deploy, but they are, as Secretary Austin said, they are the best I have ever served alongside. I have no doubts in their performance at all. They're not distracted. They know what their focus is, uh, no question. We should pay attention to recruiting and propensity because that's what comes in the door, absolutely. But in terms of readiness of the force, 
I am absolutely 100% confident that this force we have right now, best I have ever served in. Yeah, you know, I, it's personnel and readiness, right? So readiness is a big part of what we do, making sure that we are ready today, what we're modernizing for the future. And, and you know, the Commandant said it, we are ready to make, meet any significant challenge that's out there. Our forces are ready and, and we have the best and the brightest in our military today. Well, I, I am concerned about readiness. I, I, th I agree that our, our force um, is ready to move to and engage with our, the enemies of our nation as we ask them to. Um, but I worry that we're not sustaining that readiness the way we should, um, which is why I continue to vote for higher budgets uh, for the DOD than gets asked on, under both Democratic and Republican administrations. But I also think that we need to make better investments in the troops once they're in as well. We still have a percentage of young enlisted who are food insecure. Imagine being food insecure and you're in uniform. Um, uh, and, and we're not talking about the young, you know, uh, E2 who went out and bought a Camaro with, you know, right? Um, uh, or got himself in hot for tattoos, you know? Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, but we're talking about the fact is those people that are enlisted in our military have changed. They're not young, single people. There are families trying to live on something less than an E5 salary. And we have a military hunger issue that we need to address with. We have an issue with uh, a leave policy for female service members. So, so there are things that we should be doing that we are addressing. Um, and I will tell you in a bipartisan way, at least in the Senate, uh, that will make things better. Um, so that readiness, the training I don't worry about, the, the equipping, all of that is, is um, uh, something that we do very, very well. But I do worry that we're not sustaining the readiness in terms of their personal lives and the lives of their family members, because that's what's gonna cause them to quit when they're, in, when they're a young E4, because my kid's hungry and I'm having to go to the food pantry. You, you know, the fact is, right. outside of basis now, not only do you have you know, you know the, 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 the pawn shops and the tattoo places, you now have a food pantry outside a lot of military bases, and that's simply wrong. Um, I, I, when it comes to our, our paramount national security challenge, I, I, do, I do not have confidence that we are capable of deterring, let alone winning, a war uh, with China over Taiwan. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm always the bad guy on these panels, I'm like the downer. Uh, but, uh, and I think there's plenty of evidence to support that claim. I mean, you always read about the war games that we get our butts kicked and, and handed to us. You can quibble with how those are, those are constructed and the assumptions are built upon. But I think directionally, uh, that's right. We've had a, a series of high profile accidents, uh, peacetime accidents that call into question our, our war fighting prowess. Uh, we've had ships colliding with merchant vessels. We've had ships being lit on fire. We've had, you know, plane crashes, things like that. All of this to me suggests that when it comes to our foremost challenge, which is deterring a war with a great power competitor, the system is blinking red. Uh, and I don't think sugarcoating that uh, helps us uh, in any way. And just to compare it to, or pay, perhaps try to connect it to some of the stuff we're talking about, it's amazing that the military provides economic opportunities for people, provides a skill set that they can get uh, a great civilian job afterwards. Uh, that's something I didn't appreciate uh, when I joined. But at the end of the day, it's about war fighting. That's the business we're in, right? The military exists to fight wars and prepare to fight future wars. To quote MCDP-1, war fighting, the Commandant and I live by. I mean, if a, a military activity does not contribute to fighting a war, it can only be justified if it, it contributes to preparing for a possible future war. Anything else should be viewed with great skepticism. And that, I think, is where it's fair to criticize uh, some of the DEI initiatives, right? They layer on another bureaucracy on top of a force that is already heavily bureaucratized and necessarily sap resources from the military's core warfighting functions. And the final thing I say, if you look at the poll, I think there's actually a, a positive story to tell because the American people have high confidence in our ability to still get after some of those core war fighting functions, they're just more concerned about the political stuff. So Secretary Duckworth, I mean, Senator, maybe Secretary Duckworth at some point, uh, 
was right to suggest that we need to get out of the politics and focus on that core war fighting imperative, because that's what the military does at the end of the day. You know, I, I, our military is focused on the war fighting. You know, we have the national defense strategy that's out there. China is the pacing threat. Uh, we are working towards that. We are training towards that. And that is where the focus is. Uh, again, DEIA, for us, is about creating opportunity. And how do we do that for individuals? And I think it's about creating uh, an atmosphere and a culture there where where we bring in different minds of thought, you know, we're geographical diversity, right? That we just don't have one train of thought, you know, this is the way, only way to do it, right? We want to bring in different ideas. You know, I'm sure the Commandant, you know, is appreciative when he can get good ideas from the corporals and the Lance Corporals that are down there, sure. you know, giving him thoughts about, hey, how can we do things better? And, and that is what we're looking for, and that's what we're doing. Maybe, I don't know if this is a quick question or not, but it comes to mind, I feel like, because we have just gone through a pandemic. And do you think that the COVID mandate will change at all? And would that make a difference for you, Mr. Secretary? You know, again, the mandate has shown that we know that vaccines have been effective. Um, it has it's kept people alive. It's kept people out of the hospital. 98% of our, our active duty force is, is vaccinated. And, and it's played a role in ensuring that you know, our force is ready. Um, you know, ready, readiness comes in many forms, right? Uh, it's, we have to look at readiness as, you know, the health of the individual service member is a big part of our readiness that they're gonna be able to go and, and go into combat and do their mission when they need it. And all the vaccines that we have, that, that we ensure that our service members get, play a role in that and ensuring that they're able to go out and do their mission. Anybody else wanna comment on that? No. Okay. We have we okay. have nine vaccines that we require of everybody that comes in the military, all for the same reason. They're tied to readiness, the way the, the, way the congressman said. That, that's what you need to maintain a, a healthy unit that can deploy on ship, ashore, it doesn't matter. Uh, where it is having an impact, for sure, is on recruiting. Where parts of the country, there there's still myths and misbeliefs about the backstory behind it, and it's it's still having an, an impact in certain areas of the country on recruiting. recruiting. But inside the force, we probably peaked last winter in terms of getting the, all of the force vaccinated. We have, we, and we had some service members die dur during that first probably 15, 18 months. We haven't had anybody die since April, zero. All right. Units go out 100% vaccinated, ready. It's, it's critical to make sure we can do our job. Right. We, we've had... 96 service members pass away because of COVID. COVID. 93 of them were not fully net vaccinated. Congressman, did you want to say anything? Well, I, just, I think one, I say this as someone who's <coughs> vaccinated, actually, I think it's a lawful order. I don't think that that's a close call. And now I think it's imprudent based on what we know about this strain of the virus and the fact that it's endemic and unnecessary. But we don't need to argue about that. I think one le legitimate criticism is that there, the, the current status of, for vaccination policy is really disjointed, right? And that, some of that is because it, there's, there are now legal issues involved. DOD contractors have one set of rules. DOD civilians have another set of rules, which differs from the Army rules, which differs from the Navy rules, right? The Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Space Force, I think right now are under a legal prohibition from dismissing those who've requested a religious exemption, but the Army's under no such prohibition right now. So all that, I think, creates confusion. And then the raw numbers, I think, we've dismissed 7,834-ish last time I checked. That's like two... Army brigades, I, I think. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people, right? And when we, need, when we need people. So I'm not saying it, I think the order was lawful. I'm not quite there on the readiness argument, but there is a lot of confusion out there okay. right now. I was also really struck by the percentages, I believe this was in your op-ed, about how many people that we have that might come to a recruiting office that couldn't pass the physical fitness test and would be immediately you know, like encouraged if they want to join the military that you're going to have to go and try to get fit. I mean, how big a problem is that? And are, other, are any of our other allies dealing with this as well, or is that mainly an American problem? I don't know about our allies. That's a great question. Um, it's, I think the, the statistics, the evidence is there that our society is getting more obese, getting more out of shape. Of course, we're drawn from society, so it's going to affect us. The way, how do you, you know, how do you address that? Back to the recruiting force. They, they become that person's like physical trainer. Uh, 
mentor, everything that's gone. That's the beginning of their military career. Not all of us were in great shape when we first talked to a recruiter either. Right. But the recruiter made sure, hey, before you go off, I'm going to make sure that you are prepared. But it is, bad, it is not a good signal for all of society to become fatter. I mean, that can't be healthy for the nation at all. I was also curious about, there's so much more widespread marijuana use now across the country. Like if you come to New York, God bless you, it's, it's, it's horrendous. You smell it on ev everywhere you go. And it's at all times of the day. In the morning, the afternoon, the evening, it's all, everywhere. And I know that President Biden and even President Trump are being pressured to try to lift um, any sort of prohibitions from getting a top secret clearance if you have marijuana use in your system. But I just, I'm curious if you think that is a problem, if it's one that needs to be solved, or is it just what it is? Maybe, Senator? Or... Well, I mean, right now it's, it's still not a fully legal drug. I, I, I just feel like when you join the military, you know, you can't be drunk all the time either, right? right? So, so I think there are, there are uh, legitimate uh, parameters that, that you can impose. Um, I don't really see cannabis as, as, as the issue that's affecting recruiting. I'm, I'm more worried about all of the 18 to 24 year olds who can't pass the ASVAB test, you know, who can't pass the basic entrance examination that's written at the eighth grade level and can't right. do basic eighth grade math and English. That's what I'm worried about. Um, and that's a national trend also. And we need to talk about the investments we should be making as a nation into our educational system so that either high school graduates or GED holders can actually pass the ASVAB test. That's a great point. I think, if I don't remember the numbers, but I think the biggest source of disqualification, the commonality probably does, is, is the obesity issue. And that's a mm -hmm. huge problem for all the reasons you laid out, General. And then ASVAB is second. Is it? Yeah. And yeah. then uh, up there is psychological and emotional issues, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's got to be correlated with substance abuse, right? It's hard for me to disentangle all those. I mean, you mentioned TikTok. We should ban TikTok, by the way, but we don't need to talk about that. Uh, uh, I mean, just think about the corrosive effect of, of so many kids just spending their whole life. Uh, that's got to that's also impact physical fitness, right? I mean, if, you, if you spend all day online and not... Or not if you're dancing. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> Maybe there's a solution there. Just got to get the algorithm make right. Our own, so, make our own TikTok. Somebody call Bite Dance and ask you. Yeah. We've had some great questions come in from the audience. And this is an interesting one. Uh, did the military brack itself into, into a propensity problem with fewer communities with a military-based presence does that affect recruitment? I hadn't thought about it, but maybe so. Uh, I'll let him chime in. I don't, I don't think you can connect BRAC to uh, demographics in terms of recruiting. But there is clearly shifts in demographics in the US that is affecting recruiting. But I, I haven't seen anything. I don't know the evidence. I, I don't know a correlation between BRAC and closing bases. Mm -hmm. But clearly, if there's not a military presence in your community, you're not going to know anything about it. And if the only thing you know about it is what you see on the news, it may not be good. So our presence in every zip right. code really, really important. Mm. I, I, I think uh, you know definitely. I, I think we need to have a presence there. And I think um, you know, as the commandant had mentioned earlier about getting out into the schools, right, with the recruiters. Um, you know, I talked to a young sailor and I asked her what made you join, and she she said it was that recruiter, that one-on-one -on -one contact that she had with her recruiter and. Uh, and, there, and that's what we need to do. And I think uh, the pandemic has kind of stopped and prevented that from happening a lot. But uh, being able to make that one-on-one -on -one contact is still our biggest um, advantage that we have of bringing people into the military. Um, you know, if I could just go back to the last question real quick. You know, I, I think the Army has a great program that they are piloting right now about, um, you know, those, those individuals that want to join, right, but they're not quite up to physical fitness standards or they're not quite hitting the score there on the ASFAB. They're now taking them and they're doing kind of like a pre-boot camp with them where they're getting them into shape and they're working on their academic skills. Wow. And they're having great results with this right now is to, to help get more people in. That's, a, that's very I, encouraging. Yeah, I, I would think that I'm, I would like to know if there's a correlation over time um, between the reduction in JROTC programs in high schools and ROTC programs in colleges mm -hmm. and recruiting. Because I, I think that that exposure is um, a valuable one. It certainly and, stands and for reason, sure. Yeah.
There was another question here I liked, which was, uh, we haven't talked about something kind of new and exciting, and I wonder if this helps with recruitment, and the question was, what effects has the creation of the Cyber Command and Space Force had on recruitment efforts? You know, I, I think those are definitely special fields that we're going to need people in to come in and, and to serve, and I think it's just another area there where we're giving opportunity and teaching people a skill that they're going to be able to have for life. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to ensure that we bring them in and that we take advantage of them, and, or not advantage of them, but leverage their, the opportunity that they have uh, to come in there and to teach them and, and, to, take, uh, and to leverage the skills that they develop. But I think um, you know, the, the Space Force and, and the, uh, the, the cyber world and what we're doing out there is definitely something that we hope will attract more people in to come in to do those type of jobs. Congressman, do you have anything on that? Uh, just one uh, uh, part of that. We actually, we actually in recent years uh, gave the Pentagon a lot of authority to, let's say, take someone who's really talented in the cyber world mm -hmm. and kind of have a special way to get them into the military and make them a, a major or a lieutenant colonel. Our, our understanding, and this could be wrong, is that the Pentagon hasn't used that authority really at all. And it could just be because there's, I don't know, it, it doesn't work and we were wrong in kind of our theory of the case, but that's something I'd like to understand. It, what, has that not worked? Why hasn't it worked? Yeah. There's got to be a bunch of people that want to serve in the military, uh, but don't necessarily want to get a high and tight and run around and, and do pull-ups and all the, the weird stuff we do in the Marine Corps. Uh, and there's got to be a way we can leverage that talent. Just uh, picking up where he left off, I think, um we have to do a much, we, we're going to have to change how we operate to where it's easier to move between active duty and reserve, reserve in the civilian sector, come back in. We have to make it a much more permeable uh, all-volunteer force than we have in the past. People should be able to step out for two or three or four years, come back in. We, we need to, we need to uh, look pretty creatively, and that, I think that will affect propensity as well, because more people in the community then will be aware of it, of the military, they'll have a closer tie to it. Right now, it's, those, those are not literal walls, but it's, really, it's not so easy. And what, what do you need in order to get that done? Is, that, is, that, is there a legislative angle, or uh, is no. it, it's all internal? They, they gave us the latitude to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's just, we, we need to adapt, we need to adjust how we, how we operate. It, it, the Space Force is developing that model yeah. to where you know, the individual spend time on active duty, then go into the reserves, and then come back. And, and, uh, and so I, I think that'll kind of be the testing ground that we see like how it works, and, and it'll be something that the other services can observe and see how they can take advantage of it as well. And I will say, hey, we do appreciate the, the help and support from Congress on the uh, direct yeah. hire authority that, that they've given us. And, you know, when you talk about the cyber force and, the, and, and those that are doing space operations, um, you know, a big part of that force, right, and we say as a total force, are our civilian personnel that are working for, for the, the services as well as the, the DOD and um, allowing us and having that opportunity to bring those people in and yeah. to serve has been is something that we appreciate and from Congress. And it's probably not as, uh, and then you, we can press ahead, but it's probably not as understood are aware by most people that a lot of when when folks some folks leave the military the grass isn't always as green right. as they thought it would be. Sure. So a lot do come back in too. We have to make that easy as well. If uh, if they got out and a year later it didn't work out and they've got skill sets that we need in a in an area we need we should make it easy for them to come back in. One of the other questions um, that was coming in was about immigration mm. and is there a way that <laughs> immigration is a big, huge topic, and maybe not one I should bring up with eight minutes to go. But um, I was turning to the senator and congressman. If there's, there's always this feeling that there should be some sort of a way to do a comprehensive immigration reform, and maybe it would include something that has to do with immigration. But it, perhaps that isn't on the table right now. But is, should it be? Should that be part of this discussion overall? Yeah. I mean, I, well, let me tell you about the bill that I have. That. Um, I have very good bipartisan support, but it's being stopped by one person. Um, it's called the Enlist Act, and it allows anybody that's entered the United States on a valid visa, um, who has overstayed that visa for whatever reason, maybe they're the child of an H-1B visa holder and they've aged out of the system. Also DACA people would qualify, um, and it would be a way for people who currently are in an undocumented status, you enlist, 
you, you meet all the requirements. You have to pass the ASVAB, you have to pass the medical, the background check, the five-year background check that everybody has. Um, you've already been touched by the State Department once because you had that valid visa at, at a previous point in time. You enlist at that point, you get what is essentially a provisional green card. Mm -hmm. At the end of your first term of enlistment, we gave, in the bill, I give the Secretary of Homeland Security the ability to revoke that green card at any time during that first term of enlistment, should they not keep their noses clean. If you serve honorably through one tour, that green card becomes permanent. Then you go to the end of the line and you wait just like everyone else and wait your turn to be able to apply for citizenship after you've waited the amount of time. We used to allow people to earn citizenship. You want to become an American? You say you love this country? Put on her colors. Put on her uniform. Be willing to put your life on the line to defend this great nation. Show me you truly love and care for America. That is a valid way forward, and that's a way many of our ancestors gained citizenship, by the way, in this country. Um, but we stopped that in the early 90s. And, and so my bill, I have lots of support on both sides. There's a, there's a companion in the House, but I've got the, the ranking member of the, uh, uh, of the Judiciary Committee who says he's not letting anything on immigration move. And he considers immigration, I consider it a recruiting bill because all we're doing is just expanding that, right. but it's being seen as, as a recruiting bill. Um, on the Democratic side, it used to be dogma that we will only do comprehensive immigration reform. We're not gonna move pieces of it. Right. I will tell you as a Democrat and a Senate, we've moved away from that. We are willing to move pieces of immigration reform. And this I think would be one that both sides could agree on. That's a, I mean, that's a very powerful idea, I think. I, um, yeah. I, you screw up. I, <laughs> you do anything wrong. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You, and listen, my basic framework card, yeah. is Legal immigration, good. Mm -hmm. Let's make that easy, transparent. Illegal immigration, bad. Our system is totally broken. Yeah, like pay, it's only a matter of time before yeah. we figure Don't it out. Don't reward the cheaters. Yeah. Pay your fee, fines, penalties, whatever it is. Go to the end of the line. It's got to be doable. It's got to be fair. And it's got to be humane. One thing I had trouble making sense of, if you look at the propensity to serve numbers, this is in the, the youth survey, not in the, the Reagan survey, though. The drop really comes from uh, males and from... Hispanic Americans, uh, and that's something I didn't, I couldn't quite create an explanation for. I have certain, I think, ideological priors. I do think that there might be a way in which the more controversial woke policies are affecting those populations. Um, we can have that argument. I will say just on, on one point, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, the secretary or the commandant wouldn't be hearing about this from the fleet because if you're sitting there in front of the commandant in the Marine Corps, I mean. You're probably not going to get the most unvarnished uh, answer. I could be wrong about Wait, that. Wait, I know Marines. Yeah. Yes, he would. I was, yeah. Not me as a, a second. My daddy. Lieutenant. My but daddy. Let me just say one other thing, and then Kamala can tell me. Kamala can tell me why I'm wrong. The the idea that that DEIA is is a is a way is, is being sold is, is a matter of opportunity. That's actually not how it's being sold to us from Pentagon leadership. It's being explicitly sold to us as a way of improving lethality. I mean, when, when Anderson Air Force Base in Guam was sending around emails saying don't use gendered pronouns, they said do that because it will improve lethality, right? We had cadets at the Air Force Academy that were being given similar guidance. There's now a minor in diversity and inclusion at the Air Force Academy. Quantico's paying, spending $144,000 a year on a, a DEI uh, uh, official. That's more than we pay the base commander. It's being sold as a way to improve lethality. And I guess I think if I could explain the Republican skepticism, such as it exists, we have yet to see any evidence that DEI programs like unconscious bias training, like leveraging AI to reduce board bias as the Navy recommended, is actually somehow going to improve lethality. If you can prove that, then you have a good case. And now we have an ocean of evidence accumulating that suggests these programs either have null impacts, no impact, or they're actively counterproductive. They increase discord, friction, and disunity. And that's the concern from, from my side, not that I speak for everyone. I, know, I can tell you what success looks like. Earlier this week on, on your topic, earlier this week, uh, there's a battleship in Wilmington, North Carolina from World War II that's tied up there. They had a naturalization citizenship ceremony. Oh, cool. You saw, I don't no, know I, No, I just, I, I used to I be I saw it yesterday. Those, yeah. I wasn't aware of it. But anyway, they have a, a citizenship ceremony on the deck of the USS North Carolina mm -hmm. from one unit, one battalion, and they're swearing in, I don't know, 20, 25 people in, as US citizens from one unit, yeah. from like 11 or 12 different countries. That's what right looks like. That's good. 
I, one of my favorite memories of during the Bush administration was going to Walter Reed, and, um, and he, there was a similar ceremony, and the sacrifices were very real and obvious yeah. to see, you know, even with the, with the eye. And um, I think that your bill is really very interesting, Senator, and I would love to stay in touch with you on that. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll have the other guy who's holding it up on the show, too, maybe. Just see there. <laughs> if I could just say one thing. Um, you know, we want to ensure everybody in our military is able to serve with dignity and respect. That they're going to be treated right and uh, everybody's going to take care of each other. And I know this is, uh, Secretary Austin has made it his priorities, right, that we're going to defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. Um, we want those units to be strong, right? And ensuring that we're treating them with dignity and respect is going to make a stronger unit, a better unit. It is going to make them more lethal. Yeah. Um, we know that some of these problems, whether it be extremism or whether it be sexual uh, assault or harassment, can cause corrosion, mm -hmm. you know, in a unit and bring it down. And so we are working to kind of ensure that that doesn't happen. And when we know that they're, you know, on all cylinders or any, none of these things are taking place, they are going to be stronger, they're going to be better, and they are going to be more lethal. And I, I mean, I got to say that the greater diversity is helpful and useful to the force and the lethality of the force, especially as you're looking to, you know, what the recent NDS and, and, and our nearest near peer competitor, you know, with, with, the, with China and the Indo-Pacific region. I remember as a second lieutenant going through as the only uh, uh, Asian, only woman in my flight school class, right? And, and we, we got this talk like, this is what you should look like. And they put up a poster and it was like a six foot tall guy. Yeah. And I'm like, with a, you know, with, with a high end time, it's like, I can never look like this. Mm -hmm. I would never look like this. And you're telling me from day one that I'm gonna fail because this is your ideal and I'm never gonna look like that. Now we've come a long way in 30 years, but if we're gonna be recruiting from Gen Z's, right? Then we've gotta be able to also appeal to Gen Z. Um, and we've gotta be able to appeal to the moms of, of women, young women who wanna serve in the military and, and, and moms and dads of young women who know that their daughters are gonna become warriors, but their daughters are also not gonna become victims of military sexual trauma. So there is a place for this and, and the diversity, especially in communities that we don't normally go to. We go to the same well over and over again, going back to what I started talking about. We need to be recruiting from the Asian American and Pacific Islander population, especially the Asian American part, because Pacific Islanders have always served in uniform, but the AA, the, the Asian American part, right? We're not gonna attract those folks and those families, With that, right. right? Unless they see a greater diversity. And then we're gonna be more effective when you go into Indonesia and Thailand and, and, and in places like that, when there are a, a variety of faces. When my face shows up, it makes a difference in uniform. When you go to do op Operation Cobra Gold and those language skills and all of that stuff is important. So there is, it, it, it does contribute and the diversity is helpful and it is good for the readiness of the force. Just remember where we, where we were is yeah. before we start saying, let's get rid of all of it. So I always try to leave on a high note. Um, I wrote a book called And the Good News Is, partly because I was taught, well, yeah, when I worked on Capitol Hill, they said, if you go into the congressman and you have a question, um, and it's usually bad news, like, uh, Congressman, the New York Times is gonna write this really bad piece. But the good news is, like, <laughs> I did something else. So uh, I'll just give you just maybe a quick little chance to give a little bit of good news about this situation. We'll start with you, General. Uh, great point. Monday or Tuesday afternoon, uh, I'm gonna get a phone call from outer space, back to your point, mm -hmm. from Colonel, Ma C Colonel Mann. The mission commander on the space station right now is a female Marine Corps fighter pilot astronaut. That's great. You want good news? Yeah. That's, that's progress, go. to your point, that's great. <laughs> Secretary, your turn. No, I, you know, we need to get back to, to kind of countering some of the narrative that's out in the media, right, and really getting telling our story and the benefit of service and what it can do and how it can change lives. It, it, it set my life on a, a path that I never would have imagined and, and gave me uh, amounts of, of, extreme amounts of opportunity uh, to succeed out there. And I know uh, we can do the same thing for other individuals. Senator. The military is still the most highly trusted and respected institution in American society, and we just have to work hard to keep it there. As the good news, by the military's own admission, it's already more diverse than the rest of the population. So if that's an imperative, 
it sort of begs the question, what problem are we trying to solve? Second, the military has a proud history in terms of being one of the earliest institutions to force racial integration. Just look at the memoirs coming out of the Korean War. Look at Colder Than Hell by Lieutenant Joseph Owen. I mean, he talked about how the politicians had decimated the force, and though there was some reluctance, the overwhelming feeling was we needed every man we could get and that a Marine was a Marine. I believe that ethos still pervades the military, and I think that is the right ethos to guide our actions going forward. What a great panel. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you.